say good morning, which is hard to do when it's this cold. Um, last night I was looking at um, the weather app on my phone, and it said that the wind chill could be between 10 and 20 below zero. I took a screenshot and sent it to my parents who live south of Atlanta, Georgia. And in it, I asked if I could come home until spring. <laughs> they were all for it, but for some reason, the elders did not agree. <clears throat> Even my dog this morning, who was very curious as to what was going on outside, was not curious for very long. <laughs> As we get started today, <clears throat> I'm thinking about this topic of total surrender. And as we read through the material in, in our book, the series we're covering, Believe, um, it shared story after story in regards to total <coughs> surrender, of people sort of marching to perhaps their death, or marching on in the face of everything else, and biblical character after biblical character totally surrendered to God. As I read about that and I thought about total surrender, my mind switched just a little bit. Because those stories of marching into death are the end result. But the original total surrender to God comes much earlier in life. There's a beginning and then there's the end. And the beginning is not so, so much someone marching to their death as someone marching in the wrong direction who decides to stop and go the other way who's been going one way and struggling and fighting and trying to work out their life and ends up in a place where they cannot believe how they got there, stops and says, okay, God, you win. Waves the white flag, turns around, and goes the other direction. And in my mind of total surrender, I'm thinking of that person who's found himself in a mess says, okay, God, you win, and turns around. And with that in mind, I too want to go through several Bible characters. And we're going to begin sort of at the end. We're going to begin with a man in a garden praying to God for his own faith and that of the entire world. And as he is there in the garden praying, thinking over what will happen next, Will he surrender? Will he not surrender? What comes to his mind must have been the stories of countless others before him recorded in Scripture. So he's sitting there praying. And perhaps, perhaps for a moment, he thinks about a man by the name of Moses. So if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to Exodus chapter 3. And here we have a very famous story. You recall Moses, who was... Um, uh, born and hidden in the basket and taken to, uh, by Pharaoh's daughter and lived uh, well and educated well. And then one day um, he travels out into town to see the people of his kind, the Israelites, who were persecuted at the time. And he, he sees a man being beaten and he, he, he takes revenge to protect his people. And because that is found out of what Moses had done, he has to flee and run away to a place called Midian where he continues to live his life in the shadows. He goes to live, he starts a new life, he gets married, he has a child. It said he was perhaps, he was 80 years old before God's call in his life. Moses, living in the shadows, ran away to live in the desert of Midian. And then, there is the famous story of the burning bush. Moses is up on the mountain, uh, he sees a bush off to the side. He's curious about it. There's flames coming up, and he looks at it, and the bush is not burning up. Well, this is odd. He starts wandering over there, and all of a sudden, out of the bush comes this voice. And you remember what he says, take off your shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. There's a song. I'm not going to sing it because it's not my job, but Janet, you can do it later. <laughs> Uh, so Moses uh, is listening to the voice of God himself. God now calling him to a task. And God says, 
I have heard the cries of my people and their slavery in Egypt, and I want you, Moses, to go back and bring them out of their slavery and bring them to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And you would think that Moses would be so glad to be a part of God's work, right? And yet that's not the way it happens at all. In fact, we were going to see Moses um, debate him for two chapters over who exactly should do this job. And so if you've got your Bibles and you're in Exodus chapter 3, uh, we can start in, in verse 11 and see Moses' response. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? I'm just a 80-year-old man living in the desert, ran away, a, ref, uh, 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 a fugitive. Uh, from Egypt. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that as I have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And in fact, later in the story, they go back, and they're at this mountain again. It's the sign, right? So the first objection Moses gives is, who am I that I should be the one to do this? And God answers him. He says, I will be with you, and that is what matters, and here's the sign. But Moses continues. He's not done with his objections and his thoughts. And so we continue down now to verse 13. Moses said to God, uh, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites I am has sent me to you. Now that is the famous name of God. That is the, the, the biblical name. They call it the Tetragameton, the four letters. It was forbidden to pronounce for thousands of years. To this day, we don't know how they said it. Um, and so it was written down, and, and instead of reading it, they was, as they were reading it, they would say simply Adonai instead of the word itself. The name of God given in that moment. Why? Because after Moses said, who am I? He said, and who are you? Who shall I say sent me? And we get that moment. And you would think that now um, God has explained to him that God will be with him. And that this is my name and what you are to tell them. But Moses is not done with his objections. Uh, flip forward just a little bit to chapter 4. And Moses has more to say. Uh, chap uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered, uh, But what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A uh, staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. I probably would too. <laughs> then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. So what if they don't believe me? I'll give you a sign and they'll believe you. God has answered three objections now. Now we've got one more. Going down to verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. I'm not gifted at speaking. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. Four objections. Four answers. Moses still not convinced. Check out verse 13, the very next verse. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> now, isn't that very um, human, is it not? In the way of total surrender to God is this idea that I am not to come out of the shadows. I have fled to the desert. I'm 80 years old. I've done what I'm supposed to do in my life. I'm a fugitive from another land. Why in the world would I go back? Why would I come 
out of the shadows. I am very happy here on the back row. Sorry, I didn't mean back. <laughs> Sitting behind things and observing. God says, come out of the shadows. You've got work to do. I am going to use you. And finally, Moses says, okay, God, you win. And the world was forever changed when Moses waved that white flag. And the Israelites were brought out of Egypt as slaves, taken to the promised land, built a nation that we call Israel, and birthed the Savior of the world. And all the biblical history based upon that event because Moses waved the white flag and said, Okay, God, you win. I have no more objections. He came out of the shadows and it changed the world. But that's not the only story that this man in the garden is thinking of when he considers this idea of surrender. So he's, talking, he's thinking about Moses, but then he goes back further into Genesis and thinks about a guy by the name of Joseph. Now Joseph, if you recall, was one of 12 brothers. Joseph uh, was favored by his father Jacob. Remember, he had the coat of many colors, and they were all terribly jealous. My coat is black, and I don't think anyone's jealous of it. But Joseph is um, favored, and he's doing well, and so what do his brothers do to him one day? Well, they throw him into a cistern, um, and then sell him into slavery into Egypt, which doesn't go terribly well for him. Eventually, uh, uh, brings himself up to be trusted as a slave, only to have himself betrayed and thrown into prison. So then he's sitting in a prison cell. He interprets a dream. Eventually, uh, Pharaoh hears about his, his ability to interpret dreams. And before you know it, Joseph has risen from being a prisoner and a slave up to second in command in Egypt. God's plan on his life. Unbelievable. And as he is second in command in Egypt, it just so happens that there is a famine throughout all the land. And some people come to Egypt to get food because Joseph has put aside food. And guess who comes to get food from Joseph himself? Have you read the story? Who shows up? His brothers for food. And now Joseph is left with a dilemma. He doesn't know exactly what to do. And perhaps, perhaps there's a part of him still stuck in that anger. Part of him that does not want to forgive. Part of him that is unsure of what to do. And so, Joseph begins to play games with them. Um, he asks them who they are. He accuses them of being um, uh, spies. He uh, throws them in prison for a while. He asks about all their family. Because really, secretly, he wants to know uh, about his the one brother that's not there. And he wants to know about his father. And so he's sort of playing games with them. Now, if you go to Genesis uh, 4, uh, verse 22. We, we can break down his story into three parts. Uh, all three of them is when... Uh, Joseph weeps, he cries, because he's debating within himself what to do, to forgive, to let them know, to hide it. Uh, he keeps breaking down in tears and hiding it from them until the point where she comes out. So chapter 4, verse 22, Reuben replied, now they're discussing among themselves because they're in trouble, um, and Reuben, one of his brothers, uh, speaks up, talking to the group, and and, and you hear his reply. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Talking to his brothers about, well, Joseph, in fact. But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an account for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. In other words, Joseph's speaking Egyptian. They don't know who he is. Um, he, they don't know that he can understand them. And here, Joseph, he turned away from them and began to weep. But then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. So, he tells them that what you must do is go back and get his brother. 
um, Benjamin, the youngest brother, and bring him back to him. And in order that you'll come back, I'm going to take Simeon and keep him here in prison. Now he's breaking down. He wants to see his other brother. He's weeping, but he hasn't softened just yet. He doesn't know if he wants to forgive or how to handle it. So here's stage one. Now, then, uh, after that, the rest of the brothers go back to Israel. They find their father Jacob. They tell him what happened. Say, we've got to take Benjamin back. And how does Jacob respond to that? Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I've lost my son Joseph. I've lost my son Simeon, who's in prison now. You're not taking Benjamin, too. And so for a couple years they hang out, and eventually it, they get bad again, so um, he agrees, they take Benjamin back and they meet Joseph again. So then we get the second scene. <clears throat> uh, once again they come to Joseph, he accuses them of being spies, he gives them a hard time, he tells them all of these things, excuse me, um, and he says, I get this right. Okay. And as this is, uh, excuse me, okay, all right, here we go. And so uh, he has them in prison, uh, they're in trouble again, um, and so this is uh, how it goes, verse 29. Uh, he sees his brother Benjamin, the one he cares about, the youngest one that hadn't come. As he looked and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, Is this the, your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, uh, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved to the side of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. And after he had washed his face, he came out and, controlling himself, said, Serve the food. So, um, now he's seen his brother. He's cried again. His heart is softening. But he's not done yet because he wants his brother to stay. And so, um, as they leave, he, he sneaks his gold and silver cup into one of the bags and into Benjamin's bag and then says, okay, someone stole my cup. It was Benjamin. He has to stay as a prisoner. He really just wants to be with his brother. He hasn't revealed anything. His heart's softening. He's weeped twice. But it's not done yet. And then, then, the big moment happens. The oldest brother left. Um, by the name of Judah, who promised to Jacob that his son would come home, speaks up and um, promised and says that he cannot um, go home without the youngest son because he promised his father. And this becomes the breaking point. So if you've got your Bibles, we're in uh, 45. Actually, we're going to start in 44. Verse 30. So now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before my father all my life. Now then, please let your servant, this Judah, Remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come on my father. So, Judah volunteers to take Benjamin's place, and then the moment of breaking happens. Then he weeps one more time. Verse 45, 1 and 2. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And we'll continue down in verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold you into Egypt. And now uh, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Catch this. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you 
a remnant on earth, and save your lives by great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Okay, alright. So, getting the idea here. Joseph has debated over and over again what to do with his brothers. He's holding on to a forgiveness issue. He weeps twice, and then the third time, when one volunteers to be in place of the other, he sees their unselfishness, and he breaks. He breaks. And he tells them who he is. And that forgiveness issue is holding on to, how does it conclude? It was not you who sent me here, but God. Even in your cruelty to me, there was God's plan. I've come here, I've saved lives, I've saved your lives. That is as good as saying, I forgive. Because I see God's plan in that moment. And it was the moment that Joseph said, Okay, God, you may. And forgiveness rained down. And there may be some of us holding on to a sin issue who cannot, or not a sin issue, but a forgiveness issue. Someone who has wronged us in our life. Someone who has done something uh, to us that we cannot let go. And you have to, at some time, raise the right white flag and say, okay, God, you win. And I surrender. And so this man in the garden praying thinks of Moses and his unwillingness to come out of the shadows, but who surrenders to God. He thinks of Joseph and his Holding on to forgiveness, one of the hardest things in life to forgive. And says, okay, God, you win, and forgives his brothers, and sees the path in his life. Perhaps he thinks of a guy by the name of David, King David. You recall was the man after God's own heart, who, who um, worked in the, the court of the king before him, and became famous, but had to flee and run away. He eventually comes to power and does great, but then David has a real sin issue. You recall the story of he and Bathsheba when um, he committed adultery and then saw to it that her husband died and went to all sorts of measures to hide what he had done because she was pregnant. Eventually a prophet by the name of Nathan comes to David and says, uh, tells him a story about a man who had um, many sheep, but he saw a man who had only one, and he took that sheep from him. And David gets angry and says, that should never happen. Tell me who this man is, and we will punish him for what he has done. And Nathan looks at him and says, what? That man was you. That man was you. And at that moment, he breaks. And so, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we get uh, that story in a bit more detail. 2 Samuel 12. Uh, then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And as we go further down, I don't have this on the screen, but verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This is the moment where there's no more hiding. He's been found out. He cannot cover his sin. It's gone into deeper and deeper lies and more and more sins. And he's afraid someone's going to find out. And finally it comes to light what he did. Nathan the prophet calls him out on it. And finally, finally David breaks and says, Okay, God, you win. I did it. I cannot hide it anymore. He repents of his sin. And he goes in a new direction. And in fact, God's forgiveness was there. Uh, it took time, there were consequences, but David breaks. He says, I have a sin issue, and now I surrender. Okay, God, you win. We have Moses, we have David, we have Joseph. Perhaps um, 
the man in the garden was thinking about the fairness of life, and he went back and thought about a character by the name of Job. You recall Job. Job was the most righteous man of his time. Um, God allowed him to be punished a great deal by Satan, uh, to test him for his faithfulness and his loyalty. Um, God never explained to him why it happened, but Job lost everything. He lost his family, all of his wealth, his health. He was covered in boils and, and a lot of pain and just almost destitute. For the rest of his book, uh, three friends come and speak to him about his life, accuse him of all sorts of sin, and he says, I have not sinned in that way. I am mostly innocent. This is not fair. Um, this is not a result of any sin, but they don't believe him. Well, in all this and all that, uh, they had this long, ongoing conversation for almost 40 chapters and talking about theology and what's fair and what's not fair and whether or not someone who's righteous should be punished and this or that. And it's a rather beautiful story. And then finally in chapter 38, God speaks up. And it's almost frightening if you read the words. If you've ever read this chapter, uh, listen to God's response to all of their conversation. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, speaking in a storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Have you ever known God to be sarcastic? <coughs> who stretched the measuring line across it? On what were its footing sets? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And he goes on for three chapters saying, And where were you when this happened? And do you know the answer to this question? Because I do. I'm God, I'm above you, and you will answer my questions, not the other way around. And it sounds a little bit harsh. And yet, is God's power and God's righteousness and God's ability to make those decisions. And Job has to respond in a different way. In chapter 42, we get his response. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is it that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job says, okay, God, you win. It doesn't seem fair. It's not fair. I'm holding on to that grudge of the lack of fairness and the place I am in in life, but okay, God, you win. I'm giving that up. And because of that, he goes on and he's blessed twice as much as he was before all of this, as the story ends. And it took Job surrendering, holding on to that, this is unfair. He says, okay, God, you win. And continues on. So we have Moses, we have Joseph, we have David, we have Job. And then maybe the easiest one to talk about surrender is a guy by the name of Jonah. Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh and preach to the Assyrians a message of repentance. But the Assyrians were people they did not like at the time, who threatened Israel. Jonah did not want to go, so he gets on a ship and goes the wrong way. The other direction, and instead a storm pops up, um, he admits uh, that God may not be happy with him. They throw him overboard, and then what happens? God saves him how? He gets swallowed by the fish, right? It's kind of a wild story. But the part that we usually don't tell is the part within the fish. Um, he lifts up a prayer. And uh, you fact checkers can help me here, but I believe that may be the only prayer in the Bible ever to take place inside a fish. <laughs> I'm going to have to look up and double check that, but I think that's the case. And so from within the fish, he lifts up this prayer. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God and said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and he listened to my cry. 
You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. And in that prayer, he turns around his thoughts and he goes to Nineveh, somewhat begr begrudgingly, but does what he was called to do. He had to be swallowed by a fish in order to say, okay, God, you win. He was running away from his calling, the thing God wanted him to do. He ran in the opposite direction, went a different way, and eventually was stopped in his track and said, Okay, God, you win. And turned around and did the things he was called to do. So there in the garden is a man praying for his fate and that of the world. Whether or not to surrender everything, or to think for a moment of doing otherwise. Rethinking the stories of those who could not give up something. It was Moses who did not want to come out of the shadows, but rather stay in the background, who said, okay, God, you win and change the world. It was Joseph holding on to a grudge against his brothers who did not want to give it up, but eventually saw their change and said, okay, God, you win. I'll forgive and see that what has happened to me is part of your plan. It was David who had a sin issue in his life and did everything in the world to hide it from everyone. And it got more and more complicated and led him to more and more sin to where he could not hide it any longer. He gets called out. David says, okay, God, you win. I have sinned. And I waved the white flag and I cannot hide it any longer. It was Job holding on to the idea that it was not fair for him to suffer that way. I cannot give that up. God, you have wronged me. And for 38 chapters, declares his innocence. And then God comes to him in a storm and says, Okay, God, you win. It doesn't have to be fair. And instead continues on in his life and becomes one of the great heroes of the Bible. It was Jonah who said, I do not want to follow my calling. I do not want to do what you have called me to do, God. It doesn't sound pleasant, and I don't like it, and I'm running the other way. And God threw him to, into the ocean, swallowed by a fish, and Jonah said, Okay, God, you win. I will do what you want. I'll wave the white flag, and a whole town, a whole city, repented and was spared. And there, the man in the garden thinking of all of those stories, wondering whether or not to follow through. Praise like this in Luke chapter 22. On reaching that place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And that man in that moment surrendered to God's plan, waved the white flag, and perhaps for a moment he thought of doing otherwise. He did have the human side, and yet he surrendered and broke the mold. Because ever since the beginning of time, people have always held on to one thing they could not surrender. For Adam and Eve, it was the one rule they were given. Not to eat of the, the tree of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet they could not surrender that one part. And since then, every human being has held something back from God. Something they could not surrender until this moment. In the garden, when Jesus prays, not my will, but yours be done, he gives up the very last thing and breaks the mold. And for once and for all time, someone surrendered everything to God. And all things changed in that moment. The forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life. When all things were surrendered, all things were changed. And all things made good one day. 
He waved the white flag, said, okay, God, you win. And it was an unprecedented move. And it changed the world. Now, I know that that was a lot of biblical history. I, I apologize. I like to string stories together. But it's hard to do justice to any one of them. And, but I do want you to think through those stories. And which one relates to you? What is it that you struggle to surrender? Are you sitting in the shadows like Moses, not wanting to come out? and do something important, surrender that. Come forward and make a difference. Are you, are you like Joseph and there's something you're holding on to that you cannot forgive because you've been wronged so badly? And that is one of the hardest things for any human being to let go of that grudge and that anger. Can you surrender it? And realize that God's path for you has been working all along in some way. Are you like David and you're hiding a sin issue? Something that is complicating your life, taking you deeper <coughs> and deeper into trouble that you can't get out of. You're hiding it, you're lying more, you're deceiving more, you're going the wrong direction. Can you stop and say, okay God, you win, I'm a sinner and I've got to get right. Are you like Job and you hold on to the fact that what's happened to you in your life just is not fair? And you cannot let go of that. Can you say, okay, I surrender. You get to make those decisions. Are you like Jonah and God has clearly put in your heart and your mind a calling to do something in this world and you've been running away from it because you simply didn't want to do it? Can you stop running in the wrong direction and say, okay, God, you win and go back? Some of us are wandering down a path in life. We don't know how we got to the place we are. Maybe we made a few bad decisions that we thought were right at the time. Maybe we thought we were doing good things. We thought we were right. We thought we were following our path. But as it's come, we've realized there was a whispering voice behind us all the way saying your priorities are just a touch off. Are you ready to listen to that voice? To wave the white flag and say, okay, God, you win. I'll surrender. I'll stop making all the decisions myself. And I'll start devoting to something else. And if you can do that, then you can follow in the steps of the one man who truly surrendered all, Jesus, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. And if you need to surrender today, I would encourage you to do so, whether it be the one thing in your life uh, that you've been keeping back, whether it be that you've been moving in the wrong direction and need to stop and turn around, or whether you need to actually listen to that voice and come to a decision of commitment to Christ. It's time to wave the white flag and surrender. Because he's been chasing you and whispering and demonstrating and asking you and begging you to come to him your entire life. We talk about that marching into death moment, the martyrs. But it begins with just stopping, turning around and say, okay, God, you win. That's where it starts. And it can start today. Father God, um, we did a lot of survey here. And I do not know where everyone stands. But Lord, I hope that the, um, the use of several stories would bring something to mind to people in this room of something they've been holding back. Whether it be a sin issue or a forgiveness issue or a this is not fair issue or a running away from a calling, whatever it is, God, let them realize what they have not, not been surrendering. Let me realize my own, God, when I fail to give it all to you. Um, surrender, Lord, um, it, it is something that we choose to do that is reasonable in light of the gospel itself of what was given for us. It's not a, a radicalization. It is a, 
acknowledgement of grace and forgiveness in need, which allows us to embrace what you have truly called us to do. And it is not an abandoning of ourselves or our thoughts or our minds. It's an abandonment of our will and an acknowledgement of the greater priority of yours. So in this moment, um, when we decide to surrender, let us actually give something up. Because you gave everything up. And in so doing, you have become our Savior. It is in the name of your Son that you gave for that task, who truly gave it up and broke the mold. In his name we pray. Amen. It's our invitation song. Um, it is the time that we do some surrendering. If it's a prayer you need to have at your seat or come up here and pray with us or talk to someone about membership or baptism, this is a great time to simply respond and surrender whatever is left to God.